I love that little, little throwback. Shout out to the Lord there. If you've uh, been in Christendom for the last like 20 or 40 years, you know that song. I remember like in the late 1999s, because um, yeah, I'm old, um, from the 1900s. So uh, I stole that joke, but it's a good one. Um, love going back. In fact, tonight for our fifth Sunday, if you're new to our family here, every fifth Sunday on the calendar, we do something special. And tonight we're having a hymn night. It's going to be incredible. Uh, we have baptism. We're going to baptize somebody tonight, which is super fun. Um, the fulfillment of what we try to do as a church. And also, we have a few pieces of incredible news that I can't wait to share. And so come be a part of that. We start at 6.30, um, but uh, we're expecting to hopefully fill up. So get here early, get here on time, whatever it might be, and it's going to be a really, really fun time. Can't wait for you to experience that. Hey, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Sean. I'm the lead pastor here at Trailside Church. So happy you're here. If you're new or first or second, third time and haven't heard from us on a Sunday, there's a little QR code in front of your seat. You can take a picture of that. Uh, and we just want a couple pieces of information, just how to contact you and any way we can pray for you. And I want to say hello. And so I promise we won't sell your name or anything like that um, or uh, give it to anybody. But just want to say hello and check in and thank you for coming to Trailside as well. Uh, Pastor Chap will be at the info table, which is just to the, or info center, just to the right when you walk out of the sanctuary. We have a gift for you. It's not like a trailside shirt or anything like that. It's some cool stuff that you can actually use and candy. And I know everyone likes candy, so um, it's easy. But hey, speaking of shirts, uh, you may notice I'm back in my non-uniform. And if you're new here, I'm doing a thing where we're trying to pray for a new church or ministry every single week for the next year. And so if you're familiar or maybe you've moved here and have a great church back home, or if you're here visiting from another church, uh, just had a week where you could, would love uh, to connect with them. And if you, they want to send a size XL t-shirt, because although I'm joining a gym, um, it's, you know, we're still in the XL area right now, okay? So be nice to me. Uh, but we just take a chance to pray for other churches that are doing great things in the kingdom. And so whether it's a church or a ministry or an outreach, we'd love to uh, celebrate them and to thank them and promote them. And so this week, uh, is a shirt from my friend Seth at his church in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, called Accelerate. Uh, and his church is super cool in the city, so you actually got to look on the back to see their church name. But um, if you will, can we, can we pray for Pastor Ernest and Accelerate in Philadelphia right now as they are uh, having service as we meet? Let's pray real quick for them and thank them for all the work that they're doing in the kingdom as well. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning, Lord, to work through your word as we continue this series talking about things that happen at tables that you are present at. And uh, Lord, we acknowledge this opportunity that we are building the kingdom here in our little area of the Southeast, and we're thankful that there are churches all over America and all over the world who are doing incredible things uh, and loving people well, uh, storming the gates of hell with a water pistol, if you will, in order to bring people in and to vacate hell. Uh, Lord, we ask that you be with Pastor Ernest, who's preaching right now in Philadelphia. Uh, God, that you would give him just inspiration and fire from the Holy Spirit as he brings a word, and that, Lord, people right now in Philadelphia would have their hearts impacted, their eternities changed in this moment uh, because of what you're doing through that church. We thank you for kingdom ministry and for partnership, and Lord, that we are big C church, and we're not in competition. Uh, we're in this together and to be uh, people who encourage and love each other. And so we pray that you bless Accelerate Church, uh, that you would give them the opportunity to see many people come to, to heaven, to eternity, in a very hard city like Philadelphia. Lord, we ask that you bless them and be with them, encourage them, and that their footprint of the gospel in Philadelphia would be wide because of the things you're doing in their church. So we thank you for them. We ask that you would encourage them. Be with us this morning as well as we work through uh, your table, the Lord's Supper today. We thank you for all you do, God, and the things you don't, we think you should. Because you're God, and we're not, and that's exactly how it should be. It's your name we pray. Amen. So uh, we're going to be in Luke 22 today. If you want to turn there or scroll there, however you find Scripture uh, in your own context there. Um, and we spent the last few weeks, if you haven't been with us, uh, working through tables, working through these places where Jesus was found at tables with other people and the discussions that happened and the life change that happened and the challenge that also happened. And so we've spent the last few weeks finding ourselves where Jesus was at a table of a Pharisee. 
continuing tradition of elders where he would meet people or have people planted in front of him, whether it was a man with a withered hand who he healed in the temple, or whether it was a sinful woman who was likely a prostitute who found herself at his feet worshiping while they ate, or the man with dropsy a couple weeks ago. And then last week we talked about the banquet table, the Lord's table in eternity that we will have the opportunity to partake in and to party with him there one day. And we have this moment where we've seen where Jesus finds himself at tables of people who think that based on what they do, their works, their ability, their law following, their traditional cleansings, their whatever, their teaching, that they are worthy of being at the table. And every time we see these moments where people who are outcasts, who are not welcome at the table of the Pharisees, find their way in. And it's a a very clear picture of saying these are the people that are allowed and these are the people that are not. And so Jesus being at a table where people were not allowed brought those outcasts in and he taught some incredible things and did some amazing things to silence both the criticism but also to defend the law of the gospel against this tradition of the elders that so many of the Pharisees uh, held up higher than the actual covenant law of the Old Testament. And so today we break into this juxtaposition, if you will, of the Pharisees' table and the Lord's table. The invitation that's made from the Pharisees who kept it very clean and very pure and very fancy, if you will, and kept out the outcasts and the less thans, to Jesus who brings together a bunch of fishermen and a bunch of kind of idiots, if we're being honest, right? And maybe there's, you know, some doctors and other guys there, but I don't know. What, I, I find myself really connecting with Peter because he kind of just does stupid stuff and speaks too quickly, right? And, and even at the outset of this table that Peter will be at, in just a few hours, he's going to take his sword out and try to cut a dude's head off. I mean, it's just, those are the guys that, that Jesus was around so often. And so as we break into this juxtaposition, uh, we're going to do something that I'm very excited to do, which is to spend our whole time together talking about the Lord's Supper. And we try to celebrate it once a month, and with kind of the schedule in the summer, uh, we moved it back a few weeks to make it fit into this series. Uh, but what, what, I, what I've always kind of felt like, ah, about is it's kind of an add-on at the end. And there's this understanding or this maybe expectation that has been clearly stated and that we really understand. And I try to use some verbiage and make that a mini-sermon while I can to add on. And so it's been on my heart to actually spend some time working through the real understanding of what that table is and what it's supposed to look like. And so we get to do that together today in Luke 22. So I'm going to read, I'm in the ESV, which is just a different version, um, but if you have NIV, NLT, whatever, it's fine. It just will fluctuate a little bit with some of the phrasing and words, but it's the same stuff. And I'm in the Gospel of Luke, so it's Matthew, Mark, and then Luke, the third book of the New Testament. And this is what it says in verse 14. When the hour came, he, being Jesus, reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, "This cup is poured out for you." This, excuse me, this cup is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood. And so here's Jesus instituting what we understand is the Lord's Supper, and we see him gathering his disciples because what he's actually doing is he's celebrating the Passover, which is something that they all would have expected. To give you the context or remind you of the timing of what's happened here, there's a census, and it's the pr- preparation of of Passover, and so all of the people of Israel had gathered in to come worship at the temple in Jerusalem. There's a large pilgrimage. Millions and millions of people have come into the city to partake in the Passover meal together. So all across the city on this day, called Maundy Thursday is how we celebrate it in Easter, um, in the Easter season, they've come together, and all throughout the city, they're celebrating this meal together. It's kind of like, you know, Easter Sunday, even if you're not really at a church, People kind of pick a church to go to, and there's more people than you've ever seen before, right? It's the same kind of idea. Everyone, even if they didn't go to temple regularly, would at least come and save up money and go to Jerusalem for the Passover to celebrate it at the temple. 
And so we see them celebrating this Passover, and it's this meal that Jesus uses to shift from the old covenant in the Passover to the new covenant of his death and his blood. And also, the best news, his resurrection. And so as he brings them in, we see this, this shift. But it's before all those things that really opens our eyes up to what he's trying to help them understand and experience. Because as we've covered the last few weeks, the table that has been so protected by the Pharisees that has kept the outcast out, right? Even the Gentiles out, as we talked about the banquet last week. And as the, the person, the host who's having the banquet, all of the fancy well-to-dos say, oh, I'm too busy, I can't be there, I'm too busy, Jesus demonstrates his heart of the host, which is really his heart. And he says, well, go invite the people in the city and in the alleys. And he says, I, I did that, and they came, and there's still room. And he said, well, go outside of the city into the highways, meaning the Gentiles, the people who have no place, bring them in to be at the Lord's table. And so just a little while after, we see Jesus celebrating this, and he's shifting the entire narrative. Not that it's people who belong at the table because of their worthiness, but it's the people with dropsy and a sinful woman. It's the disciples who still don't get it and probably didn't for a little while as we read through Scripture. It's those people that Jesus brings in and demonstrates this institute, this thing we call the Lord's Supper. And, and what he does in this moment as he talks about the bread and the, and the wine, the body and the blood what he's doing is he's helping teach them and demonstrate all these things he's been talking about probably for the last year, year and a half or so of his ministry as he's slowly let them see a little deeper into what's called the messianic veil, right? He's shown a little more of who he is kind of as things go. As he's doing that, what he's reminding them of is that it's him, his body, his blood that's poured out that takes our shortfall, that takes our sin, and he replaces it with the sacrifice at the table. He replaces the wrath of God, what we would all without Jesus endure, by breaking his own body, by foreshadowing to what's to come, to begin right after they finish eating, as they go to pray. To, to demonstrate his sacrifice of his blood spill, that it pays the penalty, and he invites us and them in to participate and to partake in that meal. And why is it so important that we set up the last few weeks to get to this? Because what we first have to acknowledge before we even really dive in is that he says it's for the poor in spirit, the broken, the feeble, the peacemakers, the meek. It's, it's the ones of us also who are broken at our core who have sinned, who have messed up, who probably are going to mess up today because we see this movement where we lay the Pharisees down who follow all the rules and all the laws and all the things down to a T in order that they might be worthy for the table. But the ones Jesus condemns are those actions and he invites those who do not belong, who are broken, who are sinful, who are seen by everyone else as condemned by their actions and their heart. He invites those people to the table and he shares that first meal with his broken, lost, confused disciples. And as he gets ready to help them understand what's about to come. And for us this morning, my, my challenge is that we can put some of the defenses down ourselves. Because if we see ourselves in a way that says, well, I do everything right, right? I, I don't, I'm not mean to people. My social media is very clean. People just see me as a good Jesus follower. When I go on Woodruff Road, I don't cut anybody off, right? Even turning into the shops at Gridlock. I never dive my cart over in Walmart or in Costco. Yesterday, I was in Costco for a little while because I hate myself, I guess. But, and the amount of people just everywhere who are just beaming around or who are just stopping in the middle of the aisle because they saw something to go, huh, I wonder if I have that while everyone else does this. We live in a world where we are player one. We are the central character. And so even in moments where we think we might be really good and have worthiness to be at the table, what we find is that we're not at all worthy with just ourselves. But it's Jesus who says and reminds us that we are the poor in spirit. In Matthew 5 and 6, the, the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon ever preached, I would, I would say, Jesus speaks of this. He says the ones who will inherit the kingdom of heaven are the ones who are cognizant and aware of their brokenness. The ones who are poor in spirit. 
the ones who are, are loving and, and seek peace and redemption, those are the ones, the meek shall inherit the earth, not the ultra-authoritative who point fingers and step on the heads of others to get up the ladder. It's the ones who receive the glory and the goodness and the sacrifice of Jesus who will have a seat at his table. But for us to understand the Lord's Supper, we first have to understand the Passover meal and what they're actually there to celebrate. Because I think there's maybe a time where we haven't done this as well, um, and haven't done this well, excuse me, but in Exodus 12, it's actually the institution of the Passover meal. And so here's what's happened. The people of God are, have been in subject slavery for decades and decades and decades and decades under Pharaoh. And God has raised Moses up to go and release his people. Moses the murderer, yes, that guy. And as God calls Moses, I, I love what Moses does. He makes an excuse. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but when God first calls Moses, do you know what his first response is? I don't talk very well. I have a, I have a stutter. Like I, I kind of mumble. Like I'm, I'm not eloquent in speech. And God says, I'm not worried about you being eloquent. I'm worried about you being obedient. It's what God calls us to obedience. And so Moses goes to the Pharaoh multiple times. It says, let my people go, right? As we all know the song. There was an American Idol guy when they used to show the bad, the bad uh, auditions. Who the, I'll never forget him. He just kind of got up and he said, let my people go. And they did it over and over and over again. It's the funniest thing. If you haven't seen it, it's totally worth finding on uh, YouTube. But when he goes in, he says, let my people go. And it says, God, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And so these plagues come. And each plague is progressively worse and more annoying. And Pharaoh's heart hardens and hardens and hardens and hardens in his pride and his authority and what he's built. And finally, the last one is that God says, here's what I want all of Israel to do. I want you to have a week of holiness, of, of sanctification. And I want you to take a, a lamb, the most perfect one you have, I want you to kill it, take its blood, and actually adorn your doorpost with the blood. And then roast the lamb and eat a meal, waiting in anticipation for what I will do. And it says, And the Spirit of the Lord comes across Egypt, and it kills all the firstborn, whether it's man or beast. And it wipes all them out. But for the doorposts that have the sacrificial lamb's blood, it says that the Spirit of God will pass over it and then save them. And so when this happens in Exodus 12, the Pharaoh, uh, Moses goes up to the Pharaoh and he's like, I don't want anything to do with your God. Please get out. Leave. Go. And as all of Israel celebrates and they go, Pharaoh kind of wakes up. He's like, I just lost all my slaves. And so he pursues them. The Red Sea opens. They get across. Red Sea closes on Pharaoh and all the chariots, and we know the rest of the story. And if you don't, it's pretty awesome. Go read Exodus 12 through 14. It'll be pretty cool. But what, what's happening in this scene is that the disciples, Jesus is leading that Passover meal to them and reminding them and walking through, but he's also drawing a parallel with the Passover meal and what he's about to do to fulfill the covenant of the lamb that no longer must be slain. Is anyone thankful that a few days before Easter, we don't have to go find a lamb and slaughter it and adorn our homes with blood? I am. That'd be weird, right? Maybe it's just me. If y'all want that, we should, we should probably talk. Um, but if not, what happens is that they're free. And so, although, yes, that is a brutal thing to have happen, this is the context of what Jesus and the disciples have gathered to celebrate. So in their minds, in the disciples' understanding, this is just another celebration, of, another table of a yearly celebration. But what Jesus is about to institute is something far more incredible than that. He's fulfilling that law, and he's ushering in this new covenant that he has made with his people. And so as families would celebrate this meal together, they had cups that they would pass and they would tell the story. And it was actually kind of driven so that the children, the younger generations, would come up to the patriarch of the family and ask about, hey, why do we do this? Hey, what does this mean? It's a very prescriptive meal, the Passover meal. It's really cool. I just don't have time to cover it today. And the patriarchs of the family were instructed to then tell the story as they went through the meal of God's redemption for his people. Now, I'm going to say something to the fathers because I'm a father. This is not a sexist thing against the women, so let's not hyper-spiritualize this and hyper-culture it and get weird, okay? Fathers, we have seen since the Old Testament times 
the call for us to be obedient to our families and to disciple them towards the cross. It's happened in the Old Testament. It happens in the New Testament. It is our regard to tell the stories of God's goodness to our children so that as they grow and mature and become their own parents and grandparents, that they also would be, remind their own children, the new generations of all that God has done. I, 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 I think about this often. What would our legacy be if instead of our children coming down and seeing us on Netflix, right, or just hang, having coffee and sitting around watching TV or news or sports, what if our children would tell stories about us after we die, right? Or maybe not even, maybe they just will honor you in the different moments of their life and the graduations and the weddings and things like that. And the legacy that we leave is that they remember waking up early and seeing their fathers with a cup of coffee reading scripture or kneel down in prayer. That, that our legacy would be the same thing as we see in the Passover, that the things that our children wake up to is a father who not only led well, but also was, was obsessed with God's word because of what it means and what it does in the lives of our family. We see that even in this institution. At the Passover meal, that that's exactly what would happen, that as children asked, as they wandered the countryside and saw these altars, these piles of rocks to dedicate these moments to the Lord that they would see and ask. And as they asked, the parents would be able to say, this is where the Lord showed up and did this incredible thing. And he has not forgotten or forsaken those things. Even today, he is still actively working. It's a commemoration of God's redemption through that meal that Jesus begins to share what we get to commemorate the redemption that we have because of the one he is instituting in this same moment. And so we see the Last Supper become the Lord's Supper. We see a celebration of the, the central act of the Gospels. We see Jesus opening his table to the outcasts, to the forgotten, not to the Pharisees, but to the people who would follow and, and not follow well sometimes. When Jesus feeds the 5,000, the disciples are the ones who say, hey, send these people away, they're hungry. And he goes, you feed them. They're like, what? It's those people with doubt that Jesus brings into his table of redemption. And he demonstrates and foreshadows what's coming that weekend by foreshadowing his body being broken, his blood being poured out by the means of the cross and the cross leading to the death and the resurrection and the hope of eternity that we have. This is what we celebrate with the Last Supper. It not only looks back to the Passover meal that they knew well, it redefines this table, Jesus' table, of faith and family. It looks ahead to the next day for them where Jesus would be thrown under unfair trial. In the middle of the night, we would be destroyed and beaten beyond recognition and then nailed to a cross and hung where he would literally suffocate as his lungs filled with blood. And his last words were nothing about the damnation of the people. It is that it is finished. Sin is defeated. Death is done. And as he died, the earth shook. The veil that kept the Holy of Holies, God's presence away, tore from top to bottom. And that people then in that moment, as we see the centurion say, surely this was the Son of God, but that his death was not the only end of the story. That as they threw him into a grave a few days later, he would resurrect and rise again and meet them again because he had defeated death that no longer had sting. And so as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, what we celebrate is that which has already happened, which is happening now, and which will happen in eternity. That is Jesus consistently interceding for us on our behalf giving us hope and endurance that there's a promise when this life is over, whether disease or tragedy or old age would strike, that at the end of this, we will be with him because he has prepared a table for us forever. There's no greater hope in that. So my caution is, let's be weary of bringing pharisaical tradition into the church and keeping people out when Jesus is trying to bring people in. And so Jesus becomes our Passover lamb. His blood covers our lives. The wrath of God passes over us, and we live as redeemed people. 
who are saved from this empty pursuit, this way of life that we've chosen, that we in our brokenness have been brought into the depravity of our hearts, that we have naturally been inclined to get more authority and more stuff and more money and more homes and all of those things that we might levy ourselves above everyone else and say, look what I have done because of my goodness. He becomes the answer for that. And so we see in verse 14 and 15. It says, when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now, there's something that I don't, I don't remember where I heard it. Maybe it was in a class or something like 20 years ago. But there's something about this moment that's always stuck out to me because of that. Jesus' posture is wildly important when we really take time to consider it. Here's why. Because his posture at this table that's leading to his death and suffering is the exact same posture that he had when he was at the table of the Pharisees. It's the exact same posture that was normative for a meal of celebration. It's the exact same posture that he can keep because he is aware of his providence, of his sovereignty. He is not scared. Now listen, he's going to go to the garden and he's going to say, Lord, if this cup can pass, if there's any other way, then let it pass. But if not, your will be done, not mine. So in the human nature of the hypostatic union that 100% man and 100% God exists in this man, Jesus, that in that moment there is bodily fear and physical fear. But while he is with his disciples instituting the Lord's Supper, he is comfortable and peaceful. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if someone told me, like, hey, if an angel came and was like, Sean, you have 24 hours to live, spend it well. That's a popular question. Everybody's probably heard that once or twice. And a lot of people, I think, just don't understand time, right? Because they're like, I'd finally fly to Rome. Like, that's like 10 hours you're going to lose on your 24. Like, maybe, maybe consider a better way to spend it, right? But Jesus knows that In 24 hours, he will be on a cross and dead. And yet his posture is peace. His posture is normative for every other feast and festival meal. How is that so? Because Jesus' posture is a reflection of his heart. His posture is a reflection of understanding the providence of the Lord. His posture is the way that he can understand that what's going to come is not the end and that there is wonderful grace and hope and peace and eternity on the other end of this. Not not 10, 15 years ago, I remember my wife's grandparents were getting very old and were on their deathbed. They were getting close to death. And I was talking to, um, maybe it was like 10 years ago, uh, when your grandma on your dad's side died. And I was talking to her a few months before she passed away. And I remember she looked at me, and um, we were having this meal together, uh, this holiday meal, and she said, I'm so ready to meet Jesus. And I was like 28 probably with, you know, two kids at the time, young. And I'm like, I don't, I don't think I'm ready. Like, I've got some stuff I want to, you know. Like, eventually Cleveland's got to win a championship. I'd love to experience that. And I wondered how, as she faced this imminent death, she had that honesty and that viewpoint. And I think it's because when we understand God's providence and his sovereignty of what we might be leaving but what we're going to, the heart's posture is so different. And we see posture matters. And if you don't believe me, I'm about to step on some toes, and it might hurt you a little bit. You all right with that? Our posture, how we worship, Right? We talk about this at the end of all of our gatherings. We do a benediction, right? And I say, if you will feel comfortable holding your hands out as a sign of receiving, because that's what you do is you receive. It's an open hand. Right? Or we worship with our hands raised in a point of surrender, saying, God, this is all you, it's not me. We bless God. You'll see even in the benediction, I hold one hand up as a sign of blessing, a word over you. Our postures dictate our hearts. And so as we worship, know that you're free to have posture. Like, let's maybe not run around a little bit, okay? Calm down. But, but you'll, you'll see people submitting themselves on their knees, lowering themselves as they just take in the presence of God. And you might be like, well, that might be a little weird. Okay, well, let's talk about football season. What do we do when our team celebrates? Score a touchdown. Yes! 
right? Last night I was watching my favorite baseball team and my favorite player on my favorite team hit a huge home run. What did I do? Woo! Yes! Celebrate. Man, I, I hope and pray that my celebration of who God is is more celebratory than who Jose Ramirez is. And so why do we come to church scared to celebrate? Scared to worship because other people might hear us? Man, listen, I, my, my legacy be known as someone who is free to worship and to demonstrate what Jesus has done and to take in the presence of God as we sing truths and words over, over and over about how good he is. Our posture is a reflection of our hearts. And in this moment, as Jesus knows he's facing his imminent death, his posture is to be relaxed and to be the same as he was at the Pharisees' table at any other celebratory meal. Knowing that what was coming was coming, he still, because of his providence and sovereignty, had the same posture. The stakes were so much higher, but Jesus was steadfast in why he was there, even explaining to the disciples in that moment what was to come. And so it says, when the hour came, when the hour came, it's a dual equivalency statement here. It's two things kind of happening at one, right? It's when the hour for Passover to celebrate the Passover meal came. He says, when the hour came, I've desired earnestly. I've been, wa- I've been waiting for this moment. It's the culmination of his 33 years, of his three years of public ministry. He said, this is the moment. And so as the hour for Passover, which was a known celebration for them and everyone else in Israel, as that hour comes... It's also the hour that is linked with Jesus' suffering and his death and his redemption. Both of those moments are upon him. Because the celebration of Passover is now linked in eternity with the celebration of his sacrifice and the new covenant, which is what we celebrate when we have the Lord's Supper together. It's not just a piece of bread and a cup we throw down and we're like, all right, I did it. It's a moment where we recognize the depth, the reality, faithfulness, the opportunity we have to celebrate in his death also. In verse 16, it says, For I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now, in the original language, uh, the English doesn't do a great job of really explaining that. Uh, But what he's saying is that this is the last time he's stating to them, this is the last time, the final time, that I will physically eat of bread and drink of wine until the kingdom has come. Why would he say that? Here's the reality. He is the kingdom. He's saying, this is the last time before all of this stuff you've been waiting for, before the promises of authority switch from Rome to the king of the world, not, not me, Jesus, right? Like, this is the last time, but when I am back, here's what you can know. The kingdom of God will be here. All that you've been waiting for will be fulfilled. So so after this, the next time you see me, the kingdom of God will be here. I will be resurrected, and we will celebrate together. And you know what the first, this is a little preview of a couple weeks. You know what the first thing Jesus does when he comes back and shows up to disciples? They eat. And so Jesus is recalling the Passover lamb. He's sharing in his suffering, but he's pointing toward his future return. It's an anticipation. He's not saying that like, well, when I come back, it'll be. No. He's saying, for this is what I'm going to tell you. This is the last time I'm going to eat and drink on earth. And when I'm back and we eat and drink again, it's because the kingdom is here. It's hope. It's anticipation of the future of what is to come. And that future of what is to come is what gives us hope in our suffering. When our bodies break down, when disease strikes, when tragedy comes, when we get a hard moment, when bills are bigger than banks, what happens is that we have the anticipation that it's not over. And to put it in terms where we'd understand, if, if there's a place where you're struggling financially, and, but still knowing, like, I, in three days I get a paycheck and we'll be able to pay bills and we'll be okay. If you've been in that place, I've been in that place. I live in that place, it's called ministry. <laughs> it's the anticipation of what is coming that is promised that gives us perspective to continue when it's hard. James speaks of this in the first chapter and 12th verse. It says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Blessed is the man, consider that, who remains steadfast when? 
under trial. How is he blessed? For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Church, these things that we experience are but momentary. Yeah, 80 years is a long time, and maybe your tragedy or your frustration or your thing might last a week or a month or maybe 80 years, but the reality is that it's short in the understanding of eternity. And it's perspective that brings anticipation when life is hard. Yeah, it might be a rough moment right now, but who is the authority over those things? Is it you? I hope not. If we have submitted ourselves and found ourselves in death to be alive in Christ, it is His providence and His sovereignty that cares over all those things. Am I saying don't be stressed? No, listen, stress comes naturally. I'm not telling you to become a robot for Jesus, right? Like, oh, your house just blew up and everyone you know died. Like, it will be okay. That's not, that's not the gospel. Jesus wept too. What I'm saying is the anticipation of what he has led us in this covenant meal to understand is that there's nothing that can take us out of his grasp when life hits, and it will. It's the anticipation. Perspective is the, the salve to the burn of predicament. And that perspective we have is eternity. So verse 17, as we understand all that, we can then understand the bread and the cup. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Now, they celebrated with four cups of wine. It was two before and two after, right? And all my white girls were like, amen. Um, that was a bad joke. I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry about that. Please don't write me emails, or if you do, write it to Brandon. Um, that was a terrible joke. Um, but they had four cups, and they would kind of water them down. There were two or two were from before, which is this cup that Jesus is first demonstrating. Take this, pass it amongst yourselves. And then he links the two cups on the back end. But what he says in the following, verse 18, and he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is... My body. He took the bread. This is my body. Which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This body, this bread that I'm breaking is the same when you take it and remind yourself that his body would soon and now has been broken and ripped apart and hung on a cross and suffocated to death. And it's not just because he thought it'd be fun. It's because he took that on for you. In your place. He, he died the death we should. That's the key. It's, it, it's called substitutionary atonement. There's your church SAT word. It's that he steps in and substitutes for the wrath. And his body had to be broken so that his blood could be poured out. So he says, this is my body. Now in the Greek, we see where the verb is, I'm me, which means representative of or signifies. So he says, as you do this, remember, signify me. But how we view bread is something, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of um, clarity, I guess. How we view the bread and the blood are very important, right? And there's four really major concepts here. The Catholic Church growing up and coming through uh, as they were established would literally say that the body, the bread that was given, is blessed and becomes the body of Jesus, the physical body, like physical body. And the wine, the cup, literally becomes the blood. And this is something that was practiced forever. Even uh, my, my grandmother, who is with the Lord and has been since, I think, 20, or 2007, I want to say. Um, I remember even going to Cleveland and, and seeing her house and, and walking in, and she, was at, she would watch church every single day, every day. And we would talk about this, even at a young age. And she would say that you couldn't even, the little Eucharist, don't even bite it down because it's the body of Jesus. It was very, like, which, I, you know, it's like a 10-year-old. I'm like, I don't know. 
But it got to a point where in the 1500s, as the Reformation happened, that people would go and they would worship the actual bread and blood as it went by. They would adore it and it became a place of idol worship. And some would even take the bread and they would take it home and they would bury it in their fields thinking that if they buried the blood and the body of Jesus that it would bless their fields and bless their crops. Or if there was a sick child at home or a sick animal who was important, they would feed it to the animal hoping that God would bless them and would heal them based on that. And so it became this place where the reformers and the Lutherans and all these kind of other guys were trying to figure out what does it actually mean? And the Catholic view, which is called transubstantiation, meaning changing the substance of was highly debated with these other guys who were there. And so one view is transubstantiation. Another one, uh, which was actually famous by Luther in the Lutheran church, is called consubstantiation. It's with the substance of. And so Luther's thought, as they all got together in 1529 and debated all of this, all they knew is they didn't like the Catholic version. So they said, well, what does it mean then? What actually is the institute? And Luther said, that it would be under and around and kind of in the essence of, but it didn't actually change over. Now, I don't have a Lutheran background. I don't have a whole heap of study outside of just being a pastor for a long time, but that one doesn't necessarily make sense. So if you have a better understanding, please feel free to let me know. The crazy thing, I don't know everything about theology all the time. So there you go. Sorry to let you down. And there was another one with Calvin, one of the reformers in the Reformed thought, is that he is spiritually present. The presence of God is spiritually present within the meal itself. And that taking the bread and the cup was actually a means, an act of grace towards us, towards the people. And that there was some kind of interchange that happened. Or the one that's popular with us, the memorial view, which was Zwingli, who is a phenomenal, all these guys are phenomenal theologians, but if you really want to get bogged down, you can read some of their works. And Zwingli said that they were signs that represent Christ's body and blood to us, which is the view that we hold here at Trailside Church. And so he says, do this in remembrance of me. This invitation in to participate in his death. Church, this is the hard part. We are called not to just take the body and blood and be like, okay, we did communion today. We are called to be aware and remind ourselves that as we do it, we are finding ourselves alongside him in his death and resurrection. It is a place where we say all that I am, my identity, my fear, all the things that hold me back myself must die. As Galatians 2.20 says, for it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. All that I am is gone. And all that I am is now his. And it is what he has done and what he continues to do, that he continues to intercede for you on your behalf, that he always has, always is now, and always will, that that is the death we celebrate. Jesus is opening the door to resurrection for ourselves as well. That is what dies at the table today. Participation in the Lord's Supper is a total submission of ourselves and our sin and our failures and our criticisms and our angers and our pride and whatever else you carry, and is submitting all of that to him and him alone. Is that tough? Yeah. But life's tough. Wear a helmet. You want to be more like Jesus? That's what he means. It's not the Lord instituted it and we kind of give our 50% that we like or not. It is a, this is what it means to take the Lord's Supper. It is an institution of self where we are found in his death. He continues, he said, this is my blood. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And so he poured the cup. Poured out for you. A demonstration of your sin being forgiven. Now, why blood? Blood is important in the Old Testament, in Scripture always, really. But it makes atonement. It creates covenant. And so what happens, what we see actually, going all the way back to the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 15, God makes this covenant with Abraham, and he says, listen, here's what we do. I want, to get, I want you to get these different animals, cut them in half, and bring a pathway, and you and I will walk through the pathway together, holding hands as a sign of signing a covenant together. And the whole idea of that is, if either one of us breaks the covenant, may we be splayed out like these animals are as well. May we be put to death. 
a little different than today's covenant, right? Where you can call your insurance company and then they'll break up with your old one for you. Kind of different. But what happens in Genesis 15 is that God puts Abraham to sleep and he goes through it by himself to say that even if Abraham is unfaithful and has doubt and fails, that God will not fail. He has made the covenant with himself, with Abraham, and he is incapable of failing. And this is the amen of amens that he makes the same with you. You can bring your doubts, your fears, your failures and come to the table. He will not fail his covenant. It's impossible for him. Because he paid a price that is not brought up or brought down by stock market increases and decreases. It is the same and it is sufficient. God creates it for us, not with us. And so then, as we wrap this morning, how do we take the Lord's Supper well? Because that's how we will end today, by taking the Lord's Supper. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians 27 through 30. It says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So as a, your pastor, I, this is what I want to help you is to understand how to take the Lord's Supper well rather than just something that we do. The first thing we do is we, what's called fence the table. Right? This is a family meal. It's for those people who said yes, who are submitting themselves to the Father, who identify as those who love and follow Jesus. And if that's not you, I would ask you to abstain from the Lord's Supper as our elders and pastors hand that out in just a moment. But I would also encourage you, if that's not you, today can be your first communion. If it's not you, today can be the day that you say yes, that you submit yourself to the Father, and then just like we do tonight, you can come tonight, I'll baptize you. Just let me know what happened. We can talk through it. It's going to be awesome. But it's a family meal. It's not to keep the outcasts out. It's to invite them back in. And then we have self-examination and repentance. I'd ask that when you have the cup and you have the bread, don't just throw it in and take it and say it's done, but instead consider the statement that Jesus makes to die to self and to be risen with him. Ask the Lord to help you examine your heart and to repent and to forgive, to ask forgiveness for the things that you have held back from him that you have sought yourself and not him. Repentance simply means to turn 180 and go back toward the source. And so that's the idea of what repentance is. It's to stop what we're doing, those addictions, those narcissisms, those things that have held us back. It's to say, no longer will I seek that. I will pursue only him. And you run the other way. And as you repent, you then take the bread and take the cup. It's our depravity and our sin which is substituted with His covenant blood. His sacrifice in our place, in your place. The imputed righteousness, if you will, exchange. It's where we celebrate the moment that when we die and face the Father and He says, why should I let you in? That Jesus steps in the gap and says, because they are mine. They are covered in my blood My body was broken for them. And at that point, then God says, come in. Well done, my good and faithful servant. It's the exchange of our filth for the exchange of his righteousness that the Father sees us in the way he sees the Son. The last thing we do is we take a moment to be aware of the promise. We do this by looking. Looking back with gratitude at Jesus at the cross. That's why we have it on the wall here so it would never go out of frame. That as we look on the cross, we would look back into what has happened and what is still bringing intercession in our lives and the future that is coming. But the sacrifice that he made in the past in our place. We look around to the body of believers present with us. To those brothers and sisters who said yes, that we can lean on and encourage and walk with as long as the Lord has us here. We look up to heaven where Christ is interceding on your behalf, praying for you as he does, interceding for you always as your high priest. And we look forward with anticipation to the day of redemption 
that whether he comes and we're still here, whether we die and meet him on the way, that whatever that might be, that he is coming again, just as Jesus instructed at the Lord's table to remind themselves of the future anticipation of his return, we also take the bread and the cup with anticipation of his return. Because here's the truth, church. Jesus' table is open to all of those who would say yes and who would approach it faithfully. So will you do that today? Just as he took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body given for you. So often as you take it, remember me. This is the cup of my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for all so that sin may be forgiven forever. As you take the cup, may it remind you of the joy set before him that he endured the cross the hand of sinners and scorned at shame and is now seated at the right hand of the Father in moments where you might grow weary that you might remember that he sits at the right hand of the Father and is interceding for you forever as you take the blood as a reminder that his blood covers you and that God's wrath passes no matter what you might be in right now, that's sufficient and good because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you. Let's pray in our elders and ushers will pass it out for us today. Father, thank you for your cup. Thank you for your blood, for your broken body, for the hope we have, for the invitation to your table, that makes us whole. Lord, as we continue to worship, help us to be aware, to examine ourselves, that you might recall to us the places we've been angry or had insecurity or just fought, that we would submit those things to you, that those parts of us we've held pridefully would be buried, that we'd be resurrected new, and we would look and sound more like you and live as people of freedom and redemption instead of those cast in sleep. We love you, Father. Help us to love you more. In your name we pray. Amen.